Welcome to Den and Denim. As most of you know, this is a channel that praises the Levi Strauss company. But today, I've got a long planned episode that explores all of the misdeeds from the company that I could find. I've got seven social complaints that the company has endured over its 170 year history. I put them in chronological order. I don't think there's anything too disturbing and I hope you can all take it within the historical framework. Some are sad, some are surprising, but overall, I want to take the good with the bad. I hope you enjoy and learn something. This chapter is a supplementary episode to the 1890-501 review, so we can explain the terrible history of the Calico Pair without demonetizing the 501 review video and so I can put some other historical points into that video. This one isn't a shock to Big Levi's vintage fans, but it is whenever they first find out. Since the 1906 San Francisco fire, a lot of earlier Levi's history was destroyed. The company was slow at first to find out, but in the 1940s, a pair of Levi's 501 jeans from the 1890s was brought to the company. It is known as the Calico Pair. For 60 years, it was the oldest pair of Levi's known. It has helped in redesigning the replicas for the LVC collection. However, there is one major flaw with it. On the inside pocket bag, there is the text that reads, Made by White Labor. Now what the heck of a jig does that mean? You mention these facts to a modern American and say it is about a garment made in the 19th century? and you might automatically assume it has something to do with slavery in the South. The only thing they actually have in common is a big chunk of racism. Levi's jeans were all made in San Francisco back then. California was never a slave state, plus the jeans are from 25 years after the Civil War ended. So what gives? Again, these came from San Francisco, a city that has had its own share of complexity. The San Francisco of the 1880s saw the growth of the immigrants from several communities. One significant community that has made a lasting impact on the face of Frisco is that of the Han Chinese. America has never been very hospitable to most of the people immigrating here, but one such terrible story is that of the Anti-Chinese Act of 1892. Racist mobs were attacking local Chinese businesses and refusing to hire anyone of Chinese origin or descent. The Levi Strauss company got swept up with the crowd and decided not to hire any Chinese folks in its factories. Mr. Strauss knew about this. It was the same way his father had been treated in Bavaria for being Jewish and the reason his family left to come to America. He just didn't want to ruffle any feathers with the institutions and wanted to seem 100% American. Within the decade, Mr. Strauss would regret this as his worst sin. It does suck what Levi's did in the 1890s about discriminating against who they hired. But all these articles about the subject ignore the fact that their denim supplier, Amoskeak Mills, used child labor into the 20th century. Thankfully, the LBC recreations of the 1890s do not feature this racist slogan. More pairs keep popping up, so I gotta address it. The company is long distance from this time, but I think we all agree that this is an example of actual history. Okay, wow. This one is yikes. If you look through this from a modern lens, then you will see a stereotypical depiction of American Indians. If you were alive in the 20th century, then this was a common sight. However, this doesn't make it right. This pamphlet is one of the black eyes on Levi's history and reinforces the idea of the other. Seeing fellow humans as savage because they don't share the same social values and customs. Pretty much any generic Indian drawing will have the same features. Feathers in the hair, war paint, and a tomahawk. Not even a scholar could tell you what tribe this is meant to represent. I don't think this should be destroyed, but it needs to be examined through an educational lens. The idea of the other as being less than equal. The notion of how owning a pair of Levi's makes one civilized. What makes this imagery particularly harmful is the generalization of Native Americans. This doesn't reflect the diversity of peoples that exist now and before in the tribes of America. I love the souvenir aspect of Levi's. 
The flasher and guarantee tag from when I was young, and the letters, tags, and lookbooks from the LVC line. But this one, I'll leave to the museum's archives. Did Levi's traffic in the heroin trade of the 80s and 90s? A new book proposes that Levi's jeans were one of the most popular methods of heroin transactions between cartels. 501s became a status symbol for drug dealers living the cowboy life. It meant you had American connections and was often used as a gift for your associates. A pair of Levi's had a street value. Two pairs could get you a balloon of black tar. And by the way, this is in the 80s and 90s. We aren't talking about selvage denim here. We are talking about ganked from Sears. Meanwhile, the vintage market was just about to explode. It's a testimony to Levi's that they made a solid item so good that it could be bartered in untrustworthy transactions. Of course, the company had no real knowledge at the time of what was going on and not much that they could do otherwise about it. I'm sure cars, guns, and lots of other products were traded as items. Ah yes, the two horse patch. This is another one of those features that began in the 1890s and is still used to this day. Did you know that it is a portrait of a slave being drawn and quartered? Or at least that's what some folks online suggested in 2008. Both images share the idea of horses pulling in opposite directions to rip something. In one, it's a pair of pants, and in the other, a human. There's the two horse logo. We assumed it meant jeans that are so strong, wild horses couldn't rip them apart. Then there's an illustration to Samuel Clarke's A General Martyrology, published in London 1651. It depicts religious persecution during the European struggles of the Reformation. You were Catholic or Protestant in the wrong place? You died. According to Africa Check, a fact-checking website that declares this viral message to be incorrect too. Levi's is not promoting torture or hidden racist message. This ain't a pack of Marlboro. Fun fact here, this isn't the first time the two-horse patch has undergone scrutiny. In the 1914 novel Ruggles of Red Gap, a British butler meets a mountain man and was shocked to see him wearing, quote, faded and quite wretchedly spotty overalls. Then the butler catches sight of the famous two-horse patch on the back of the pants and remarks, I mean to say, one might be reduced to overalls, but this blatant emblem was not a thing any gentleman need have retained. Oh la la! Levi's has been sponsoring the arts for over a century. They decided to give some artists free reign for an exhibit at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Los Angeles. Some of the art pieces were printed onto Levi's t-shirts to make souvenir merchandise. One featured an African-American maid using poor grammar. But you know, this was the 50s and that was the way things were. Wait, this was 2012. Eesh, Levi's, what's wrong with you? Don't you have dozens of lawyers reviewing this kind of stuff? Of course, there was an instant backlash and the shirts were pulled. This is an embarrassing moment. There's no backing out of that. Levi's history famously celebrates the miners who first bought and wore blue jeans. The gold rush is what put San Francisco on the map. But it is also a story of manifest destiny and ignores the devastation endured by the inhabitants prior to the arrival of Europeans. The Ramaytish were the original residents of San Francisco. They were one of the tribes that collectively made up the Olone Nation, which covered the entire Bay Area and modern-day San Jose. My great-grandmother was a member of the Rumson tribe from Monterey. I love Levi's and I love my family history. However, during a miners' exhibition featuring Levi's historical items and promotions, a group of protesters staged demonstration. It turned bloody. And no, actually, the protesters got along with the exhibit participants and they shared some laughs and drinks. Meet Rachel Gelman, a descendant of Mr. Strauss's sister. She is also an activist for Jewel. Jews on Olone land. Terrible name. 
The organization aligns with the principle in Judaism called Teshuva, which could mean repentance or healing a relationship. They run some workshops that raises awareness about the Ohlone people as they live now and had lived in the past. There is a sense of trying to integrate what exists of the Ohlone culture into Jewish practices. I like the idea of an acorn on the Seder plate. Especially if you have a vegan Seder plate and you need something egg-like, a nut works very well. And I like the symbol of the acorn as being this pre-Columbian collectiveness for California. It's a plant that would have been wildly grown and consumed. I think what Jewel is doing is great, but it's hardly revolutionary. I hope it positively affects some people. You know, if you live in Europe, then you probably know what tribal peoples lived there about 2,000 years ago. It was well documented by the Romans. Most Americans have no idea which tribe lived where they stand now. A lot of the names of the tribes of California were lost to history, and they took Spanish-based names. I grew up in Los Angeles, and I was taught in the fourth grade about the California missions. But they didn't bother to teach us about the Chumash people who lost their culture when the Catholic missions took over. I think the most practical hope here is that American schools teach about the local tribes. This would give young students a better connection to a specific group of people who had a specific culture. And then we could stop generalizing Native Americans as just one people. There's this SNL parody of Levi's commercial is called Wokes. Suggesting the company is overly concerned with its public image being in line with current social acceptance. If it weren't for seeing Keenan, I would have thought this were a real Levi's commercial. I don't think Levi's is too woke, and if you do, then maybe you skip the previous chapter. Remember, Levi's is the evil oppressor of the Ohlone Nation. Maybe you haven't noticed their spokesmodels are a diverse range of privileged. But maybe a San Francisco-based company isn't for you. In 2020, Levi's former brand president, Jennifer Say, claims that she was bullied out of her job because she wanted schools to reopen during COVID. You know, poor her with her million dollar severance package and great resume. It's a little hard to sympathize knowing what most people actually live day to day. You play at the top of the game, you're going to fall for any reason. Yeah, but only far right media outlets have picked up her story, so I don't lend too much credit to it. I'm not going to come up with any excuse for any of the situations here. They are what they are. No company is perfect, and I accept that a company with such a long history will have its share of cultural regret. There are plenty of things I don't like about what Levi's does, but at the moment, they are cultural norms. For example, crappy made, cheaper clothes made in China or other dictatorships. Making the LVC line items in Turkey a hybrid dictatorship. Pumping cash into already wealthy celebrities who are famous because of nepotism? We'll make progress, but all in good time. What was the most surprising or most reprehensible action on this list to you? Leave a comment. Thanks to my Patreon members. Get in on the action and support the channel. Here's a playlist of other denim discussions. I'm Den. Thanks for watching Den and Denim. Love your jeans.